And now yep, without thank you. further ado, we'd love to have uh, Vanessa Kump join us, who is um, presenting on avoiding complications of HPN. Thank you for joining us, Vanessa. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Good. Now let's see if I can share the screen. That's a tough one to follow. Thank you, Swapna. <laughs> I will do my best. Vanessa, I was thinking the same thing. Oh, I'm glad it's you and not me. It's all downhill from here, but I'll maybe do my best. Um, okay, let's pull. Okay. Okay, let's see. It does that work? Uh nope. Wait, you right, right here. Yep, there you go. Yay. You got it. All okay. right, you're all set. All right, so I get to talk about avoiding complications of HPN, which could be a, a trap because here we've got all these positive inspirational thoughts after listening to Swapna. And now I'm gonna talk about complications. So I don't wanna be all doom and gloom. So my, my objective, or these are my objectives, I wanna really talk about what you can do to maximize the benefits. So instead of thinking about, oh, here are all the complications that can happen with HPN, let's kind of flip that and talk about how can we minimize the complications as a way to maximize benefits? Um, think about it from that perspective. So learning how to monitor your therapy, something as simple as reading the HPN label, when to contact your healthcare provider, all things that are really key in trying to minimize complications. Some of the common misconceptions that I run into as a clinician, first of all, there's this underlying um, misconception that HPN is toxic. And you're gonna run into people that have this really negative um, opinion about HPN and wanting to do everything to avoid it. Sometimes at the result of, of starving a patient and seeing somebody go, you know, become significantly malnourished just because they're afraid of the HPN being toxic. And so that's really a misconception. If it's used appropriately, it's life, uh, it's a lifeline, it's life saving. So kind of thinking about it and it from a different perspective. There's a, other misconceptions that all patients receiving HPN are homebound, they require home health, and that's simply not true, obviously. And then the other misconception that all healthcare professionals are knowledgeable regarding HPN, and that we, we know is not true. And in fact, you know, we really have a risk of consumers getting wrong information, getting misinformation regarding HPN, which is one uh, really a place where Oli really is helpful in educating consumers. So let's talk about maximizing benefits. I should put my microphone down. I just thought of that. Um, okay, so maximizing benefits. Striving for independence with self-care really is a key component of maximizing benefits. And this has been illustrated um, with evidence that uh, those who are independent with self-care have less complications. So our education should really focus on tech techniques for self-monitoring. We really need to advocate for, um, as a consumer, you need to advocate or a, as a caregiver advocate for taking an active participation in your care, having a voice that is so important as a tool to maximize benefits. Establishing HPN goals, what are your priorities? We heard a lot from Swapna as, as far as, you know, her priorities and how they changed over the course of her, of her life. But, you know, if it's getting back to work, going to school, traveling to see your grandkids, whatever that is, you need to have goals What and, and kind of priorita, prioritize what those goals are. I think that's really important. Next is to find a qualified team of clinicians. So important. Swapna um, 
touched on this as well, all the way from your prescriber to your home infusion providers. Um, it's really important to find qualified team of clinicians and it may require shopping around, moving around, traveling, trying to um, find the best fit. It's not an easy prospect by any means. Um, next, maintaining active communication with your team and your team of clinicians is important in order to maximize benefits. We all need to be on the same page and communicating. Hopefully this is a little bit easier with um, more access to um, not only the telemedicine, but just through the email portals, through your, hopefully through your providers having access for easy communication. And then lastly, making sure you pursue that supportive care of whatever your primary underlying disease is, is important. So the complications I'm gonna talk about um, are listed here and we're gonna go through them one by one and talk about things you can do as a consumer or caregiver to monitor for these and really aggressively monitoring for these complications is, is the best way to, to catch them early, to try to treat them early, to prevent them from occurring in the first place. So this is where really you can take an active role in minimizing complications. So let's first talk about dehydration and overhydration. So it helps, I think, to have kind of um, a reference point for what's normal for a normal person. What are the normal fluid requirements? So it's a weight-based, so if you weigh more, you're gonna need more fluid. So anywhere, usually like this two to three liters a day is an approximate average daily intake, fluid intake. Most of that comes from oral intake, 75%, but you do get some from metabolism of food as well to meet those requirements. So if you are somebody who doesn't absorb everything from what you eat and drink, you would obviously expect to need a, pro a proportion of those fluid requirements IV. And it's gonna vary person to person, obviously. So another good reference point is to know what's the normal fluid output. So your, your urine output should be somewhere between 1200 to 1500 mLs a day or for a 24 hour period. And this is important for keeping the kidneys healthy. Normal stool output is, is pretty minimal, but if you've got diarrhea or high ostomy output, you're obviously gonna need more fluid intake to, to, um, um, to meet more, you know, to meet those fluid or the stool loss. And there's something called insensible losses, which basically means something you can't measure, but just through your skin that you lose fluid through your skin and your lungs. And that accounts for about 500 mils a day. So that's normal. So it's hard to know, you know, there's a lot of these unknowns. How much do you absorb from what you eat and drink? What are your IV fluid requirements that are a component of your HPN regimen? So one way to assess that is to assess for dehydration. And some people, some of you guys are really good about assessing for this, but some of these symptoms are somewhat vague or nonspecific, things like lethargy, a rapid pulse, feeling lightheaded, maybe having a dry mouth or dry eyes, irritability. Um, those are somewhat you know, subjective and, and somewhat vague, uh, sometimes kind of creep up on you where you don't even realize it. Oh yeah, I may be dehydrated. But there's some objective things as well that you can look at. And one is a reduction in urine output. The urine you typically becomes more concentrated and decreased in output and weight loss. So those are some subjective things you can look at as well. And then you can also look at this skin turgor where when you pinch the skin, how fast does it go down as a way to kind of assess your hydration level. On the other extreme, overhydration. How do you assess that? So you can look at if you're retaining fluid. So if you're standing and that fluid goes down to your ankles, if you're laying down, you may see fluid going into your face. 
So those are things that you can see. That may be a sign. If you've got difficulty breathing or weight gain can be a sign of overhydration. So we would potentially, you may be asked to monitor intake and output as a way to assess hydration requirements, IV hydration requirements. Or monitoring weight is really an easy thing to do. And you know we recommend you do it at the same time every day as a way to really compare apples to apples because your weight will fluctuate greatly before and after TPN. So you really want to weigh yourself. We like to say like the first thing in the morning when you come off TPN to weigh yourself. And it's a good way to assess hydration. There are intake and output records you may be asked to keep. I think urine output is probably the most important important as a way to assess hydration because you know ultimately we want to make sure we, we're giving our kidneys enough fluid so urine is really important and if you're not urinating enough you have risk of of hurting your damaging your kidneys long term we like to set up parameters on when we want to hear from you and um, every provider may be different, but some things that may, that we like to hear because you may be at risk for dehydration or, or overhydration. Number one, if you've been vomiting, new onset vomiting that lasts more than a day, we wanna hear from you. If your urine output is less than 500 mLs a day for two days in a row, uh, if you've been monitoring that, Anyway, we would like to hear from you. If your ostomy output changes significantly for more than two days, we want to hear from you. A weight increase or decrease by more than one pound for two days in a row, give us a call. If you start a medication to treat fluid retention, that would be something we would want to know. So all of the things that we can, uh, parameters to help guide if we need to give you more fluid or less fluid in the TPN. So obviously, you know, you've got a week supply of, of bags and if issues come up during the middle of that week, it's best to then address that if you need more fluid through supplemental IV fluid bags. So if, if you're at risk for dehydration, you really need to have IV fluid bags available in the home to be able to address this without having to go back to the hospital. The next issue would be blood sugars. And uh, you may be asked to monitor your finger stick glucose. And if, it, if you're monitoring finger stick glucose in relation to the, the HPN, there are ideally three times of the day you wanna do that. One hour after starting the infusion, sometime mid cycle. So those are numbers that are going to make, we want to make sure the number doesn't go too high. Your blood sugar doesn't go too high while the TPN is infuse, infusing. And then within that first hour, 60 minutes after stopping, you want to make sure that's when you're at risk of the blood sugar dropping too quickly. So you can test it to make sure it doesn't drop too low. So those are kind of the best times to test it. And not everybody's going to need to do this. This would be somebody more, maybe, you know, somebody going out new on HPN, somebody with insulin in the bag, you know, trying to um, optimize the insulin dose. So you may be asked to do this. An easier way to, to kind of screen for a high blood sugar is to monitor urine sugar. And this could be done, basically what this does, it, it tests for the presence of sugar in the urine based on the premise that if your blood sugar is high, it spills over into the urine and then we can test it this way. So we're indirectly testing for a high blood sugar. And it's best to do this first void in the morning, just to, to dip that uh, strip into a stream of urine. And it will, it's got this color chart. You can compare it onto this color chart to see if there's presence of sugar in the urine. So it's an easy screening thing. Sometimes it's good to do it, um, like if you've increased the dextrose in your TPN and you wanna make sure you're tolerating it. So a high blood sugar, you may have symptoms, frequent urination, you may feel thirsty, there may be blurred vision. Uh, you may 
have a difficulty gaining weight if your blood sugar is high. That may be uh, the, pre the way it presents. You may have no symptoms. Uh, one of the things we worry about is a high blood sugar does increase your risk of infection. So that's one reason why we want to make sure we keep it well controlled. Um, it also may be a sign of infection. If it acutely goes high, that may be a sign of infection. So we would recommend that you call us if your glucose is greater than 180 or if your urine glucose is positive. What about a low blood sugar? Um, you may have symptoms like sweating, feeling trembly, feeling hungry, anxious, weak. Uh, you may have then difficulty walking, difficulty with vision, personality changes, confusion, you know, on more of the extreme side, but typically, um, you know, it responds well to taking in some source of, of sugar. And, but we would want to know about that if the glucose is less than 60 or if you're having symptoms of a low blood sugar. So we can make um, corrections. So next let's talk about what you can do to monitor your IV catheter. And the complications here are a little bit more um, potentially, well, infection is definitely probably the one we worry about the most. That's what may get you back in the hospital. Um, be could potentially be a life-threatening complication. So that's one that we need to be really aggressive for monitoring infection. Um, you may have other complications such as occlusion, blood clot. Uh, you know, every time you put in a, an, a catheter into that vein, it is it damages the vein and it then um, increases your risk of a blood clot to that vein. Or it may just be you've got a leak, a, a tear, a rupture with the line. So when to contact your provider if you're having any issues with your catheter. Fever is really something we always want to hear about. If you've got a fever, temperature greater than 100, or if you feel shaking chills when you hook up to TPN, that may be a sign of an infection. Um, if there's redness, tenderness, swelling, or pus at the exit site, we want to hear from you. If you're not able to infuse due to, you know, occlusion with, with that line, if there's swelling in your hand, arm, shoulder, neck, face on the side of your catheter, that may indicate a blood clot. So we want to hear from you. Or pain or discomfort in your neck or shoulder when infusing may be a sign of a blood clot. Uh, any, if there's any crack or leaking when you infuse, we want to hear from you. And even with resistance with flushing, um, we may need to address that. Next, when we look at electrolyte, vitamin, nutrient imbalance, we really rely on labs for that. And I've got lab the lab monitoring listed here. You. Everybody's on a different schedule. Uh, typically we start with weekly for, for most everyone and then we decrease frequency once these labs are stable. And you may be at a point where you're requiring labs once a month, but certain labs like the iron levels, the vitamin D, vitamin B12, trace elements, those are not done as often as some of the other labs but you should be on some kind of a schedule so that though all of that is being monitored, monitored to make sure we're optimizing what we're putting in the bag. And then I put bone density on there too. But don't forget about our bones. We need to make sure we're monitoring that. So this is illustrates a, HP, a compounder and we all know we're, it's done in a batch fashion for the for the consumers getting it in the home setting with the nine day expiration or beyond use dating kept at refrigeration. So those medications that can degrade over time have to be added prior to administration, which would include like a multivitamin or insulin. So there, I was just looking at this yesterday and I noticed a problem with this picture, which I don't know if anybody, too bad we don't have an audience where I can say anybody notice a problem with the picture, but so I will just tell you, this was taken on an, in the inpatient pharmacy 
And that's why the bag is yellow because we add the multivitamins for inpatients because we do one bag at a time. We don't have to worry about those vitamins degrading over time, but in the home setting, that would not be yellow. The vitamins would be added by you before administering. The, uh, oh, monitoring your formula. Um, I really feel like you need to know what's on the label. So we need to monitor the formula for the content, nutrient content, the volume in the bag, obviously how long to infuse it, the expiration date, and uh, those drug additives. One of the reasons I think, if nothing else, why it's important to know the content of the label is because of there's, you know, so many product shortages going on, on and off. And the, sometimes the only way you're going to be able to identify it, if you're not being informed of it, you can at least look at your label to make sure everything is there and not um, taken out. So this is an example of what a label would include keeping in mind that, like I have it just listed as generic, amino acids, lipid, multi-trace element, multivitamins, those are all kind of a generic, but you would have a specific product that's listed there because not every product is the same. Uh, you wanna know specifically what trace element is, what trace elements are being added. If it's a multi-trace element, you know, there's really only one, but well, there's more than one if you're pediatric. Um, anyway, uh, what else on there? So that discard after date, the expiration date, you're going to want to know. The volume to be infused is there on the label, but then you've got the compounded volume. So keep in mind that there's there should be an overfill within each bag so that the bag doesn't run completely dry bag should be chilled upon delivery. So when you get your delivery, make sure they feel cold to the touch. Circulate your supply with each delivery so that you're obviously you're keeping the, so that they don't expire on you. You can verify there are no leaks and no floaters, you know, visually looking at the bag just to make sure it all looks appropriate. If a lipid emulsion is unstable, uh, you can kind of watch for this. If you if there's an unstable lipid emulsion, what would happen is the lipid particles um, coalesce or start um, attaching to each other and become larger. And what happens is they then would occlude the filter and the pump would alarm. So if you're getting these occlusion alarms, you need to um, make sure it's not because of its it being an unstable lipid emulsion. You would call your pharmacy and discuss it with them. And I just, I know I just have a couple minutes here, but I just wanted to give a couple slides, two slides to talk about bathing and showering if you have a tunneled catheter. And this comes up sometimes just as guidelines. What do you do when you have a tunneled catheter as a way to minimize problems when, with bathing and showering? Can I take a bath and can I take a shower? So what we recommend is to wait two weeks after placement before you would take a bath. I mean, before you would take a shower. So you can take a bath as long as the dressing stays dry, but not to take a shower until, you know, wait a good two weeks. And then once four weeks, after four weeks, that tunnel should be well healed, the track, the cuff within that tunnel. And at that point, we feel like it's safe to submerge under bath water at the four week mark. Same with swimming, wait at least four weeks before swimming in a chlorinated pool, but really to avoid swimming in any natural sources of water, such as lakes, ponds, or oceans, voiding hot tubs and whirlpools, which is what we recommend. Not to say everybody follows our advice, but that's what we recommend. And really to give a plug for the Ole Foundation resources, they've got great resources on their, on their website. Um, for dealing with a lot of these questions that come up and then also some articles that hit on a lot of um, different topics that I want to make sure everybody's aware of. And then finally, a poster that 
I think we all need to, like I said, we all need to advocate for our own um, safety. And this is a poster that's intended to remind hospital staff to treat your line properly. We know that's an area that's, that's a, um, a big problem. So in summary, strive for independence with self-care. Know what you can do to monitor your response to therapy. Monitoring will help minimize complications, keep your healthcare provider updated, and you can take an active role to improve outcome. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Vanessa, that was wonderful. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to chat them in the chat function. You can send them uh, directly to me, Andrea Guidi, or if you want to send them to everything, everyone, that's totally fine as well. And I can definitely uh, field those for Vanessa. Where let's see, where's the chat? Anybody's anybody so chatting yet? The chat is like there it is. Yep, there it is. Do you see it there? I do. Okay. So it looks like someone has uh, been told a fever of 104. Oh, as the cutoff. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, that's a good point. Everybody's gonna have different parameters. So it is um helpful to know what your provider is is telling you 100.4 I think is good sometimes you almost want to individualize it somewhat too because we have some people that kind of their norm is 99 or they may have a normal it may not be unusual for them to kind of have a little high grade temperature mm -hmm. so you may need that individualized uh so I, yeah, 104, some people say 101, everybody's a little bit different with that cutoff, mm -hmm. but um, that's good to know that it, it may be different. Great, we have some more coming in, Vanessa. Can you shower with an IV clear over the accessed line without adding another cover on top? Hmm. I mean, if, you know, some of those are pretty effective at keeping it dry. I mean, ultimately you want to keep it dry. If it's, if it's um, greater, I would still wait at least two weeks before doing that. Um, and then, you know what, if it, if it becomes wet, damp, starts, uh, you know, not, you know, the adhesive is not intact, then that would indicate, um, needing to change it but you know that may be adequate to keep it dry great um well since the summer's upon us shortly uh what dressings do you recommend to keep line dry when swimming other than aqua guard patients are asking for more options i am not the best person to ask about yeah. that <laughs> i am not uh I would check with your infusion pharmacy and maybe you have to see what they carry and what they're able to, to provide, but I am not sure. And does anyone else have any more uh, questions for Vanessa? Do, I will make a point, but because this is kind of the fundamental um, issue with the swimming and the um, having a tunneled line. I mean, it's great having a tunnel line because, you know, it is less risk of infection than say a pick line where that, the, the access to where it enters the vein is under the skin. So those organisms from your skin are, don't have access to get into the bloodstream, right? It has a lower risk of infection. So the, really the purpose of the dressing with a tunneled line it, once it's healed, you know, after that four weeks and the line is healed, the purpose of that dressing is to keep it anchored in place and to keep it from getting yanked and moved on, you know, pulled on, which can irritate that exit site. The dressing is not to keep it sterile and free from infection. It is really there just to, pro to provide it, it anchored in place. So that's where if it does get wet, you just change the dressing when you get out of the pool and um, 
you, it's not an infection risk per se once it's healed. Right. So I think that's uh, an important concept to keep in mind. Yeah, yes. I'd like to jump in here and showcase that the fact that we have resources available on the OLE website and, you know, that describes some of the risks so that you can decide for yourself how to go about it and um, whether or not, if you want to go, if you want to try swimming. I think yeah. the decision is yours, but we have, uh, we have the information to help you make those decisions. And we also plan to address swimming or host a discussion group on the topic of swimming with a central line at our annual um, meeting, only mm -hmm. 2021. I love it. That's, yeah. I mean, such a great topic. People are, are really um, wanting to pursue that. So That's they have to know the risks and benefit. Absolutely. We have time for maybe one more, Vanessa. Uh, we have someone writing in, uh, my daughter is lifetime TPN dependent and has been on SMOP lipids for years. My choice because of a more holistic fat composition than intralipids. We are revising her calories and have switched her back to intralipids. What is your thought between the two? Okay, I'm trying to, the intralipid is more holistic or the, my choice because of a more holistic fat than intra. Well, SMOF is, is gonna be more balanced. We are revising calories. I mean, I, at least theoretically, I feel like SMOF has a lot of advantages over intralipid. Um, potentially um, there are, you know, with using SMOF, you need to use more of it to meet your essential fatty acid requirements than you do with intralipid. Um, and then Penny has a comment about using clinolipid. So that's another choice of a lipid that is going to be a little more balanced than just intralipid. Intralipid is just soy lipid by itself. Clinolipid has olive oil and soy. SMOF has four different fats, soy, olive, MCT, and fish oil. So I would really, you know, work with your clinician. Everyone's different in what their needs are, and there's pros and cons of each. But I think as we've learned more about the disadvantages of a soy-based alone lipid, especially long-term, it makes sense to use some of these other lipids that are more balanced like clinolipid or SMOF. Mm -hmm. um, so that tends to be what our thought is, is to kind of going more towards these more balanced lipids. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. It was great. Your talk, talks are always super informative. So we appreciate you sharing your time with us today.